Um, before we uh, start um, with our uh, geological experts, we also have a short introduction by uh, our colleague Dori Egre. She works for Energy Club and will give us an overview of the situation um, with, with PACT. Um, so coming to um, the authors of this very, um, yeah, let's say controversial study, Scott Becker, he is a well-known researcher in earthquake geology, active tectonics and seismic hazards at the University of Vienna. He is also um, very often a member of teams um, with IEA missions, NSWEC, which became well known for the stress test, NAGEVA, uh, but also the Austrian Ministry of Environment, with a uh, focus, of course, on nuclear safety and natural hazards. We have also Tamas Boroki, he's a Hungarian geophysicist and expert in applied geophysics, seismic explorations. And um, he was the director of the Laurent Geophysical Institute of Hungary. And so he's of also um, very experienced in this issue. We will have um, presentations after Doris' introduction. After that, I'm happy to announce we will have um, a discussion um, among us, but we have, um, I um, see already two or three experts from the field, one in the legal questions, because of course the, the part that we have to inquire about is what do these facts mean, of course, for the, for the licensing, environmental impact assessments, um, ESPO convention, are there any implications? Um, so I would ask you now, Dori, to start with the introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Patrizia, and I would like to welcome everyone as well. Before uh, uh, continuing with what is happening in Hungary concerning the nuclear expansion, I would like to shortly introduce the joint project and Energia Club as well. So in the joint project, uh, European NGOs, research institutions, they have been cooperating uh, for almost 20 years on safe and sustainable energy issues with a focus on anti-nuclear activities in Central and Eastern Europe. I see now that uh, multiple people from the joint project are uh, have joined us today as well, so welcome to them as well. Um, Energia Club uh, is an organization having spent close to 30 years in creating new awareness in Hungary uh, concerning energy issues. Um, with our research, training courses, wide-reaching wide communication, we aim to make energy producers, users, and perhaps even political decision makers uh, to act with regards to energy usage. Um, we are working uh, with joint project uh, on the nuclear expansion in Hungary, which uh, is the concern of today's meeting. As you all probably know, uh, we only have one nuclear power plant currently functioning in Hungary with four nuclear reactors. Uh, but the Pax2 project is, um, is undergoing and uh, we have, we'll we'll have uh, two new reactors uh, to, to ensure the, uh, the continued use uh, of uh, nuclear energy. But this has been a hotly debated topic for more than 10 years. In 2009, the Hungarian parliament gave its provisional acceptance for the possible expansion of the existing nuclear capacities. And in the following years, Preparatory inquiries uh, were taking place for the establishment of the new reactors. However, the documentation of these inquiries were not made public, uh, which resulted in multiple years of litigation. In 2011, the parliament accepted the so-called national uh, energy strategy, strategy, sorry, according to which Hungary will keep using nuclear energy. But uh, the turning point came in 2014, which I think was one of the most shocking decisions uh, in political history in the last 10 years, because without a tendering procedure, agreements were signed um, with the uh, Russian state-owned company Rosatom to supply two new reactors and the uh, Russian Federation financing 80% of the investment costs, which amounted 10 billion euros. 
Um, in 2016, the Pox2 project company submitted its site license application to the competent authority, which is the Hungarian Atomic Energy Authority. According to the project company's website, acquiring the site license was a two-step process. The first step was when the project company compiled um, the program of the site investigation and evaluation, uh, which was approved by the Hungarian Atomic Energy Authority in 2014. They state that the program was made with broad and detailed knowledge on the site, uh, which we will cover today. During the second step, the site investigation and evaluation program was implemented. The goal of the site investigation and evaluation was to identify every natural and human circumstance, um, uh, characterize their effects on the design of the nuclear power plant and verify its safety. The site license, site license application had to prove that, that the site was fit for establishing a nuclear power plant. The key statement of the site investigation and evaluation was, according to them, that the site was suitable for accommodating new nuclear power plant units. The site features were defined by technical and scientific standards, and as these were taken into account, they say, uh, the safety regulations, new units could be designed and established. And finally, in 2017, the Hungarian Atomic Energy Authority authorized the site license application. And uh, it was Atletso that reported first in 2017 the site, that the site of the NPP and the planned expansion does not comply with the International Atomic Energy Agency's earthquake safety recommendations because uh, there is an active tectonic fault line that passes under nuclear facility. Less than 10,000 years old traces of earthquakes were found on the surface in the immediate vicinity of the site. But despite the report and the extensive investigative work done by Atletso, the state carried on with the project. Since then, the implementation and the construction licenses have been submitted. And uh, obviously it's quite concerning that new scientific results come to light and the Hungarian Atomic Energy Authority says that they are aware of the results, but they are still saying that everything is okay. There is not a danger to the plant site and this is what we are about to discuss today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. So I think we continue with uh, the geological uh, presentations. If it's okay, Kurt, uh, would you start? We introduced you, I think, before you were here, so. Um, no problem with this. Thank you, I'm, you were I'm ready and to I start. Want. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Okay, I don't have the screen under control. Thank you all uh, who participate for spending this hot first, one of the first hot summer days with a hot topic in front of the computer. Now, my purpose here is to give you some insight into the results of a recently published document that was, uh, that we, myself and Esther Hintersberger, who was at that time uh, working at the University of Vienna with me, on active tectonics, active faults, paleoseismology and such topics. Uh, so we did this, uh, this project uh, for the Austrian Ministry of the Environment, which changed its names from time to time, but this doesn't care us here, uh, with, the, with the background to evaluate from a geological point of view, the site documents that are available for Park 2. If we can move on. So we did not make a full scope assessment of these documents. We focused on a very narrow focus. And this is highlighted in the uppermost lines. The power seismological assessment of the citing documents focused on the potential of surface displacement by an active geological fault. 
this would be called in the terms of IEA and the international uh, regulations uh, pertinent to nuclear safety capable faulting. Why did we do this? Now we read the Hungarian governmental decrees on nuclear safety requirements. And there are two of them. They are listed here, 731800. Sorry for these complex names. The first one here claims or requires that potential occurrences of permanent surface displacement on the site shall be analyzed. And I know that nobody of you is now really aware of what is a permanent surface displacement. I will show this in the next slide. Much more important, the next uh, decree, 731.1100, says if the potential of occurrence of a permanent surface displacement on the site cannot be reliably excluded, the site shall be qualified as unsuitable. So please note, it's not necessary to prove permanent surface displacement. It's necessary to reliably exclude the possibility of surface displacement. And this was our task in this report to evaluate are the Hungarian uh, geological documents reliably excluding uh, this uh, uh, permanent surface faulting as a hazard for the site of Park 2. Now, what is permanent surface displacement? No, sorry, next slide, please, uh, Gavi. These are the documents that we evaluated. We did not do any own research. We just looked into three types of documents. The first on the left-hand side is the geological site report. Extremely valuable literature, thousands, maybe thousands of pages of uh, re-owned Hungarian geologists and geophysicists examining this the site and producing a report which is really comprehensive uh, and containing all, hopefully all relevant data from the site. This is one branch of, of, of the basis. The second one is the site safety report. The site safety report has been done by the company MVM Parch 2. And they distilled their site, site safety report from the geological site report. And we also looked on the distillation process. Is everything which is necessary or which is important and described in the geological site report also found its way into the distilled product? I can take this in advance. Not everything that the geological society community found out is in the site safety report. And second, and the, the third thing is that we checked the site permit, which was then issued later on by the Hungarian Atomic Energy Authority. So this is the basis of our work. And now let me solve this with the next slide, the secret of what is permanent surface displacement. We are somehow talking about earthquakes, but not the shaking through an earthquake, but the fault that fractures the earth's crust and some of the faults by producing strong earthquakes also fracture the Earth's surface. This is shown here in a recent example from New Zealand, 2010, the Darfield earthquake. And you see that the blocks in the meadow, the Earth's crust blocks moved as the arrows show, one to the left, the other one to the right. And they displaced this uh, water channel for something like two meters. This water channel survives. It has no problem, but guess there is a critical infrastructure, a water dam, he would not survive. The chemical plant would have its problem. A nuclear power plant would have severe problems to survive such a displacement should it disrupt the significant parts of the equipment of, of any of such facilities. The next slide shows other effects of the same earthquake. And you can see the road on the left-hand side could not sustain the forces of the earth. No way to do so. Uh, you see all the cracks and you see all uh, the fun that this little, I hope future geologist, I'm sure that he studies geology meanwhile and specialized on paleo seismology, standing in one of these gaps that were produced in the earthquake. Remember this little guy, we will see him again during the presentation. So this is the effect that we are searching for or that we are evaluating. The next slide, please, shows that this is not an academic discussion. This type of hazard fault capability affects nuclear plants. And the, the, the most recent one was the Niigata earthquake in Japan, who 
uh, fact that the Kashiwasaki Kariwa uh, nuclear power plant, you can see that the earthquake, the fault, destroyed the access roads, but it left beside the reactor. So they had a whole bunch of luck with this earthquake and the fault, which is capable, was capable at this time and, and ruptured the Earth's surface. So this is the hazard that we are looking at. Now, the next slide brings me to Pach. We were in Japan and we were in New Zealand. Let's come back to Central Europe. The map on your screen is a, a tectonic map. In the middle of the map is the site with a yellow polygon marking the site of Pach. And from the top to the bottom, more or less, in north-south direction, you can see uh, blue lines denoting the Danube that passes the Parch 2 site. The gray polygons are faults, geological faults, active faults that move uh, the Earth's crust in this area of the Pannonian Basin. The most important one is the DHF set, which is the, and now I have to look this up, the Dunaschent Gurgi Harta fault zone. Sorry for my bad Hungarian spelling. Uh, uh, which, as you can see in this map, is located right below the site. Now, all the triangles and uh, the, the blue waves that are, and the red stars and the, the other stars denote evidence for large earthquakes and displacement of very young sediments that were collected in the geological site report. Very unfortunately, the corresponding figure, which looks very much like this in the site safety reports, excludes all these evidences. There is no evidence marked in the site safety report, uh, no red star, no seismite, no green triangle. Next evidence that is collected for, next slide please, in the geological site report. This is another style of, of showing the Tuna Schent Gurgi Harta fault zone. Uh, I don't want to explain the details in too much uh, word, too many words. Here in this uh, circle, the site is right in the center. This is because uh, the geologists had to uh, analyze a, a circle with 50 kilometers diameter uh, radius around the site. And you see the black line that comes from the lower left to the upper right. This is the fault zone that, that we are, have just seen in the first slide. And in Hungarian language, you can see all these uh, bubbles that point to some places, uh, denoting some earthquakes, denoting some geomorphological evidence for the activity of the fault. This is on the left-hand side. This is the geological site report. On the right-hand side, and there is a spelling error, this is the site safety report. This has been produced by FM MVM Parks, and you see all the information on the nice neo-tectonic, on the quaternary active tectonics is missing in the figure on the right-hand side. Now let's con continue to the next figure, please. <clears throat> Oha, can you put once more? No, then I don't know what's the case here. It should show another type of figure, but we can continue two slides more. The next, please. Now, no, just the, the one before. Looking at the site now, not in the region around the site, uh, this is the map from the geological site report that denotes the extent of the Tuna Schenk Gurgi Harta fault zone, which is delimited by the bold red lines here. So you can see that these bold red lines cover the southern part of the, of the site. The site is here shown in showing the, the existing reactors and with the yellow polygon, the site where the future reactors should be placed. That you can see that the fault zone extends quite far into the area where the future reactors should be. And it even extends into the area where the reactor blocks should be. This is denoted by the yellow broken line here. Now, how do the geophysicists come to this? Yes, thank you, Gabi. If you move south, you can also show the existing power plant with the mouse, maybe. Yes, this is here. So these are the existing reactors. 
Moving to the next slide shows you a profile. This is hard to digest for non-geologists and non-geophysicists. This is a cross section to the Earth's crust. Uh, it is crossing the fault zone that we have now seen looking down to the surface in a, in a cross section. What you see is the uppermost few kilometers of the Earth's crust. So it's really going deep down because earthquakes happen deep down in the crust, but the faults come up to shallow surface, as you can see, indicated by all the red lines here. And you can see that the faults down, further down in the section are very narrow and they get much wider going upwards. And this is a situation where geologists get lyrical and they call it the flower structure because the green faults in the depth this is the trunk of the flower and the leaves of the flower, the blossom are the red lines closer to the surface. So you see that this type of fault widens to the surface. It branches from one main fault deep, deep down that produces eventually an earthquake up to dozens of faults which arrive eventually at the surface. So this is the architecture of this type of fault that is underlying the nuclear power plants in, in Parch. The next slide, please. So here we are back to the map that we have shown just before. The, the, the section that you have seen is just opposite side on the Danube, opposite to the power plant site itself. Uh, the line PA22S approximately uh, locates the section that I have just shown in the, in the last slide. Now, this is the figure which is shown in the geological site report. Let's continue to the next slide and look at a similar figure, but only similar figure, which is in the site safety report. To the left, the geological report, and to the right, again, I'm sorry, with a spelling error, the site safety report provided by Parks, MVM Parks compare the width and the location of the faults. On the left side, the geologists claim that the fault extends into the area where the reactor blocks should be. On the right side, MVM Parks claims that this fault does not touch the reactor blocks. Uh, this is one of the points that we want to clarify with our Hungarian colleagues in the future. Is this just by chance or is this on purpose or what happened between these two maps? This is one of the things that need urgent clarification in my opinion. Uh, the next slide, please, Gabi. Now, you have seen this map already. <clears throat> just the new thing is now a white arrow in the lower left that points to what is written in blue. There is PA212 AROC. And this is a trench that was excavated <clears throat> for paleoseismological purposes, and which I will show in the next slides. Before I show the trench, the next slide shows again a cross section, a seismic section, uh, depicting the layering of the sediments in the earth, in, in the subcrust, in the in the earth's crust. But this time we are not looking down kilometers deep into the crust, but this time we are looking only few tens of meters down. So what we see are the youngest most, the uppermost sediments. And in the lower panel, you see colors like uh, yellow below. These are old, relatively old sediments. And what, oil, what is above the pink and the green, these are extremely young sediments, sediments of the Danube that were deposited in the last couple of hundred thousand years with the youngest, very most, very youngest sediments on top being few tens of thousand years old. And what the Hungarian geologists and geophysicists have been drawing here, they have been drawing 10 individual faults that come up almost or really to the surface, cutting the youngest sediments. This is shown in the lower panel, the red lines that really come up to the surface. Now, based on this, the paleoseismologists in Hungary got some appetites to excavate a trench. And you see on top, there is a red bar which marked this next slide. So this is the location of the trench. 
So they excavated only two of these faults that are shown by the geophysicists. They had a look, a close look on two out of 10 faults. This I would like you to keep in mind. Now the next slide is very easy. Geologists having fun, creating a trench and hoping to get a good exposure that shows a lot of funny and interesting geological structure. So this is the working method. You look for a caterpillar. This excavates a profile of the soil. And by looking on the profile of the soil, you do your uh, the conclusions and interpretations. This is done. The result is shown on the next slide. This has been produced by Halas and his co-workers, the Hungarian colleagues who did the paleo seismology. And it is showing a profile that corresponds to one wall, one of the walls of this trench. What we see, we see the horizontal stratification of the sediments of the Danube. So all of these are Danube flood sediments. You know, when you live near to the Danube, a Danube flood leaves some sand on the riverbank or some silt or some mud, and one flood after the other builds up this sediment pile. What you also see are the red and orange lines. These are the faults that cut these sediments. And you see an horizon, a sediment layer that is leveled with E1, event one. Many of the faults, mostly the red ones, terminate at E1. Why do they do so? Now, at the time when sediment E1 was deposited, the fault ruptured, broke the surface, and the faults were at the surface. This happened something like 20,000 years ago. It could not fracture the upper sediments, the fault. It could not fracture the younger sediments because they were not yet deposited. They are not yet here. After the earthquake, younger sediments were deposited up to the level of E2, nothing happened. And then again, an earthquake happened with faulting at the surface, creating the faults that come up to the level E2. This was something like 19,000 years before present. And since then, new sediments have been accumulated. And fortunately enough, not a younger event of surface breaking faulting occurred because the younger sediments here seem to be intact. So we learn from this, there are two events, 19,000 years and approximately 20,000 years ago of faulting, which fractured at the Earth's surface, the Earth's surface at this time, not the present Earth's surface, because it yet the present Earth's surface has not been yet deposited 20,000 years ago. How do the structures look like? The next slide will show you this. This is the soil profile in person. You see the stratified, horizontally stratified sediments. All sediments are from the Danube, flood sediments. And in the left picture, in the middle, they are disrupted by a funnel-like structure. This is the surface breaking fault. And if you closely look at the, at the bands of these sediments, you see that they are offset. They are fall down into this funnel. And you see that the funnel is, is, is filled with something very different from what is to the left and to the right of this funnel. On the right picture, a similar structure is seen just a little bit left of, the, of, of this uh, colorful plate in the, in the middle. The next slide gives you an impression how this can be interpreted. Here is our little boy. The nowadays paleo seismologist. Now, this was a structure similar to what we have seen or learned in, in New Zealand. This was a structure that pertained to the Earth's surface, created this funnel like uh, crack, which then later on, of course, was filled with something else, as well as the crack where our little boyfriend is standing will be filled up in the future again. So this is the paleo seismological interpretation of the situation uh, excavated in this trench. The next slide. Very unfortunately, this is the only trench that has been excavated. So the only strong evidence for, or also maybe against surface breaking faulting that is available in the whole bunch of documents which cover a few thousand of pages. 
Another promising uh, location would be PA22S. This is where the white arrow now points on the other side of the Danube. And here, uh, the seismologists have acquired another very promising seismic section, which is shown in the next slide. Again, showing the uppermost meters of the sediments that are underlying the meadows and the forests along the Dan Danube. And here you can see 16 individual faults counted by the seismologists and geologists doing the interpretation here. Very unfortunately, we have no further evidence whether these faults came up further, closer to the surface. We don't have evidence uh, of their age. We don't have evidence how much of set they have, et cetera, et cetera, because no data, no paleoseismological data have been acquired there. So the next slide, now you can relax. We leave the field of geology, we come to some conclusions. The first conclusion is not very scientific, but rather popular, I think. We have tried to draw the extent of the, of the Duna Schentgergi Harta fault zone on this mock up of the future and existing nuclear power plants. This is a picture that you can download from the Parks 2 homepage. And by locating uh, the, the buildings and the shoreline of the Danube, it's very fairly easy to, to figure out where the fault runs in this uh, picture. Well, the fault is here denoted by the reddish polygon. And you see that it's all below the existing power plant and it extends into the future power plant based on the data that are available from the geological site report. So this is the first conclusion. Yes, there is a fault. This is active fault. It underlies large parts of uh, the Park 2 site. The next slide. Here, the first conclusion is paleoseismological data from the trench next to the site confirm the existence of faults that led to permanent ground displacement in the past. They did so 20,000 years ago, they did so 19,000 years ago, and they will do so in the future. Because geological tectonic faults are not switched off because somebody builds a construction on top of it. What did MVM Park make uh, as a conclusion? In the site safety report, you can lead, read seismic events occurring in the research area are not able to significantly displace the surface. It is the fault planes cannot be considered capable. We wonder, and we really would like to know how MBM Parks came to this conclusion, looking at the pictures that you have seen already from the trench. Uh, we, confer, we, we concluded in our report that this is not in line with the geological evidence described in the geological site report. And we make here a rather strong statement for scientists, but I think it is supported by what uh, we did as a comparison between the reports is that this is contrary to the principles of good scientific practice. The site safety report downplays certain uh, data and does not account fully for the contents of the geological site reports. This is one of our conclusions. The next slide, please, Gavi. Second, again, paleoseismological data uh, confirm the existence of faults that lead to permanent ground displacement. What is the conclusion with respect to the Hungarian governmental decree? I read again the decree, if potential if the potential of occurrence of a permanent surface displacement on the site cannot be reliably excluded, the site shall be qualified as unsuitable. Cannot be reliably excluded. So if we don't care about what we have seen in the trench and just focus on cannot be reliably excluded, I would say that one trench 85 meters long on a fault zone, which is one kilometers wide and consists of dozens of faults that come up to the surface is not sufficient to exclude the possibility of permanent surface displacement. Not to talk about the proof that we have seen from the trench, which is 85 meters long. And you remember the, the crack 
that would have looked similar 20,000 years ago to what uh, the little boy here is standing in. The last thing, slide, I think. Uh, we conclude from the geological site report, mainly from the geological site report, but this is also stated, I have to say, in the site safety report, that a wealth of geological and geophysical data uh, proves that the Tuna Schenker, the Harta Fault Zone, is an active fault. This is an interesting statement, not so much with respect to Hungarian regulations and IEA regulations, because, yeah. It is not a good site, but it's not the site exclusion criterion. But if you look in the Russian codes, the NP03201, which is a, a code uh, dealing with the siting of uh, nuclear facilities in Russia, it clearly states it is not allowed to locate nuclear power plants on the sites directly situated on active faults, full stop no comment else made in this regulation. Why is this interesting? Now, yeah, the background is that the Russian provider uh, should provide the nuclear island and the whole nuclear power plant. Having in mind that the site in Russia would maybe not found, be found suitable as a nuclear power plant site. This is the end of my presentation. The last slide is just again the mock-up uh, showing the extent of the fault zone below the nuclear power plants. Thank you for your attention and sorry for doing so much geology. Yeah, um, good. Thank you very much. Um, I think, yes, it was a very good presentation. I see there is applause. That's a rare effect on Zoom. So, Peter, we cannot hear it. Um, but we can continue, I think, with a little bit more geology. I see there is um, appetite growing. So I would ask, um, please, um, Mr. Tamish Bodoki, would you please continue with your presentation? Hi. You have to... Um, Excuse me. Thank you. <laughs> Last year, I had to read all the reports and documents and regulations used by and cited in an Austrian study written by Dr. Decker and Dr. Hintersberger. You have just here it. On the site investigation of the licensing process of the plant patch and PP at an quite unexpected request. During my work, I found a tiny part where maybe I can add some more information to the topic. That part was a selected and licensed size of the new MPP itself. Here, the, the regula regulations, as you have heard, are a little bit more strict. Namely, there is no need to prove that there are no near surface or surface breaking faults. It's enough if we cannot reliably exclude their possibility. Now, there's a non existence of uh, potential, uh, non existence of displacement can be proved either by trenches or by shallow geophysical measurements. However, the site was filled up artificially by sandy and muddy, somber muddy materials, which covers a surface in a thickness of two to five meters. And because of that, trenches couldn't be practic practically used. They would be too, too much deep. Thus, the only way left were the shallow geophysical measurements. From the point of view of geophysics, as the area can be regarded as a two-layer structure. The bottom and the top layer mostly of, uh, consists mostly of sandy gravelly materials. The underlying order and more compact Pannonian strata consists clayly and sandy materials and probably are 
characterized by lower specific resistivity and higher seismic velocities. These, these are physical parameters which are used by geophysics. The interface between them can be found at the depths of uh, 22 to 32 meters under the present surface. Now, I should like to uh, show, uh, show a, a slide. This is a, a and and excuse me. This is a geophysical, a geological cross section of the northern part of the selected site. You can see here on the upper part the quaternary layers and below the Pannonian one. According to the regulation, the fundamental question is here, can we exclude the possibility? Yeah, uh, one more. Here the uh, surface is understood as the original surface, which is now under the field. So uh, if you see, this was the original surface. According to the regulation of the fundamental question is here, can we exclude the possibility of the permanent near surface or surface displacement within the site? The geophysical report gave the following answer. Based on the available data below, we can, can state with absolute certainty that the fault zone crosses the entire preserved Pannonian sequence. However, there are no data that can provide a definite answer to the question of the tectonic involvement of quaternary sediments. Now, unfortunately, if there is no data providing a definite answer, then the permanent surface displacement cannot be excluded. Consequently, the site should be qualified as unsafe, unsuitable. Now, up to here, the story is much more a legal issue than a geophysical one. But now I would like to show that not only that we cannot prove the non-existence of surface breaking displacements, but based only on the data published in the report, it can be proved that they exist with a rather good probability. The final geological report presents all original geophysical profiles measured on the site. However, in the report, raw data cannot be presented and, and in an online report, mostly processed geophysical sections are given. In the present case, they were given in image format. So to deal with them, one had to copy them from the PC screen and instead of real geophysical processing programs, one can work with them only with image processing steps. Geophysical investigations inside the area of the selected site were carried out by different means. Todd and his co-authors, the authors of geophysical report, gave an account of them in 2016. As a first preparatory step, EM electromagnetic and GPR ground probing radar measurements were carried out to see how much had been that former industrial area disturbed and contaminated below the surface 
by former human activity. EM uh, had a depth range of about one meter, while that of GPR was about two meters. The EM measurements provided a specific conductivity map of the uppermost uh, one meter, indicating a lot of underground artificial objects, especially on the southern and southwestern part. These are the yellow and red colors. But the northern and northeastern part seems to be quite undisturbed. The GPR profiles here, black lines, are sparsely located and they served only for controlling the EM map. Neither EM nor GPR provided information below the original surface because of the fill. As a second, as a presented, uh, look, as a second phase of the insight investigations, electrical resistivity and seismic refraction survey were carried out. The reports presented the location map of the electrical resistivity survey, which had a depth range of about 30 meters. And the final geological report presents all the resistivity profiles in an axis. I show one of them. Theoretically, they should indicate the quaternary Pannonian interface, but it isn't the case. Probably their depth range was not large enough. A number of high resistivity uh, um, anomaly can be found on them, but we did not get any geo geological explanations. The geophysical report explains those with measurement difficulties. However, I think that at least some of them should have been checked by shallow drillings for better understanding. The geoelectric research thus remained unfinished and was not interpreted from the point of view of neotectronics. So no data from them. The results of seismic refraction survey were similar. Obviously, the velocity jump of the seismic P waves expected at the quaternary Pannonian interface were not enough large to create the necessary reflective, refracted head waves. Now, as for the two methods mentioned, we had to come to a conclusion that they, they were unfit to answer the basic question. The last method used was a seismic S wave. It means transversal wave reflection survey. The geophysical report presented the location map of the survey and the final geological report provided all the profiles of the survey in an axis. Uh, here is a, a location plan of the seismic reflection net. So the technical details of the survey is described and the profiles are presented. No any results are mentioned in the final geological report because the profiles of the shallow reflection s wave survey were not interpreted and not analyzed at all. The reason of that is, says the geophysical report, that the underground artificial objects created high disturbing noise level, making impossible the in, in interpretation. I think, however, 
that the underground artificial objects are not so much disturbing for the seismic reflection measurement as it was said. The S-wave reflection profiles, or at least a part of them, are well interpretable. And that gave me the idea to start and try to interpret them. To carry out the interpretation, some prel preliminary steps or decisions had to be made. At first, at first one had to sit. At first one had to select a part of the area where the disturbances are, are absent, or at least are below a certain certain level. Based on the EMF, the northern and northeastern parts of the area seem to be the least disturbed ones. The next step was finding a criteria to separate surface noise from events indicating geological changes, since their appearance are very similar. Neotectonic faults in sediments are indicated by phase shift in, uh, the, of the seismic horizons of a profile. But unfortunately, surface disturbances cause also phase shifts. So I selected the, a criteria which is based on the specific velocities of the phase shift, because the phase shifts, uh, the surface disturbances on the, in each profile have higher specific velocities than those phenomena, uh, which can be bound to geology. Finally, one had to answer the question of resolution, namely, how large is the smallest displacement which can yet be detected on a profile? It proved to be about one meter, and that is a value large enough to be significant from the point of view of seismic hazard. After all the phase shifts, were, uh, I marked the phase shifts on the profile. And uh, following that, I could see that on the profile fragmented and quiet zones. Mr. Bodoki, yes. can we, I don't know how much longer um, your presentation lasts, but it's almost four o'clock. So we need to get, I but think- I am just at the end. Yeah, yeah, I'm just, okay, excellent, excellent. I didn't know. Uh, you can see here a, a, a profile unmarked and marked. Yellow is, a, I think, geology and green is, a, disturbance. Now, if one indicates the locations of the fragmented, uh, fragmented segments on, locate, on the location map of the survey, then a zone is outlined which can be interpreted as a neotectonic fault zone penetrating into the quaternary upper layer. In that zone, at some distance, and at some places, displacement reach the surface and the direction of the fault zone correspond well to that of the side faults on the southern part of the main DH zone. Now, here is a disturbed zone, a convex, uh, horizons westward, rising horizons, eastward rising horizons. And now, if I put here is a, what I think is a surface breaking cold zone. Now, to finish, it seems that the results gave a certainty of the existence of the 
surface breaking pool on the selected site. However, even if we have got much more than a no data uncertainty is yet not that complete certainty because the techniques applied at the so-called PC screen seismic were the interpretation techniques of the 1960s. Because instead of real seismic data, only images were available. Another problem is that the profiles are too far from each other regarding their depth range. And because of that, the correlation between them is difficult. At the end, as conclusion, I would say the measurements should be continued. The resistivity profiles should be checked by the links, and it would be worth comparing them to the corresponding seismic profiles. Secondly, the net of the seismic reflection profile should be made much denser to, to get sure results here. And really as a closing word, I am very much afraid that if we, had, we, if we have, have sure data, the final results will contradict the statement of the site license. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, also for the very clear conclusions. Um, before we go into more geological discussion, I would like to ask if there is some media which we know some are, some journalists, perhaps they would like to ask a question before they hurry on and we enter the debate. Are there any urgent questions in general to the experts? Uh -huh. Excuse me, I haven't understood quite well. I, I only ask, I thank you for your very clear um, presentation. I think that you agree, obviously, but you also added on that you think there should be more investigations made. And as we heard before, it's, it's not okay to say we don't know enough, so we guess it's, it's safe enough. It's rather the other way around. If we cannot prove that it's safe enough, there shouldn't be a new power plant built. But for now, before we enter the discussion, which certainly will be very interesting, um, I only ask if there is media representatives or journalists who would like to ask question first before we, we continue discussing uh, seismicity and yeah. licensing. Yeah. There's a question in the chat. Can you see it? Yes, yes. Um, we have a question from an Italian uh, news agency. And this is the strongest earthquake, whether you could um, tell him what is the strongest earthquake to be expected in the Paksh area and how high would the Paksh 2, the Paksh 1 and the Paksh 2 nuclear power plants resistance, robustness um, to those values for earthquakes be? It's a question I mean, the, for the, me. It's for both of you. Yes. Then. So the, the yeah. Two two earthquakes was mentioned in the report. Both of them more than six point five magnitude. It's a very large earthquake. And the first, the patch, patch one, patch one power plant that time was re reinforced after the first uh, site investigations to bear uh, a 6.4 magnitude earthquake, but. Uh, I hope it will not be tight. So, and how, uh, when can we wait the next earthquake? It, nobody can tell. Yes, and for patch two, I assume there would be different values they're giving for what they're constructing now. I don't know. Uh, yeah, anyone I, knows? Uh, uh, what I do think, I do think that uh, from the 
documentation that we have seen, it should be designed for 0.35 G. This should be the design basis uh, expressed in ground motion, uh, in ground motion parameters. But I have to say that we did not check this uh, type of hazard in our assessment. Uh, we suspect that the, the conclusions on the activity of the fault and the, the mere abundance of evidence for strong earthquakes that we found in the, site, in the geological site report. Remember, there are 20, uh, around 20 strong earthquakes, each exceeding possibly magnitude six that were recorded, geologically recorded, not historically in, in paleo seismological data from the area around the plant. I'm not sure if this is all considered in the seismic hazard assessment, but this is not, has not been checked. And uh, so far, I have no reason to doubt that the Hungarian colleagues did a wrong uh, assessment for the seismic hazard, for the ground shaking, so for the vibration. Uh, without, uh, we have the doubts with uh, respect to the permanent ground uh, displacement. And thank you, Tamas, for your, for your clear presentation from the geophysical data from the site itself. <laughs> Yes. For me, it was clear. <laughs> I, I should like to the earthquake question to tell some more that we have a very short uh, data uh, sequence. We see the earthquakes back only to some hundred years, even not, not yet to some hundred years. But here we speak from uh, thousands, 10,000 years, and this creates a very high uncertainty, and uh, uncertainties are always dangerous. Okay, um, so are there more questions or? Input? Yes, Franz? Franz, you're muted. Yeah. Okay, now you should hear me. Oh, okay. I have a question. As far as I remember, the site license itself stipulates that a geological survey has to be continued. Is somebody aware what had been done in the last years? Mostly nothing. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, this is relevant, isn't it? Yeah, because uh, yes, there is a, it is an obligation for MVM2 to follow uh, the, the points listed in the site license. The site license is addressed to MVM2. And if the site license says that a geological survey has to be continued and nothing is going on or nothing had been done so far, well, somebody is not fulfilling uh the duties even there are open questions uh, i address this issue or the, this question because we could also interpret the site license in a way that the regulator thinks that there are still open questions which have to be followed good if the project company doesn't follow it violates the license isn't it? Yes, yes. It's, it's so, but I, I don't remember very well on the sidelines. I have to ask uh, Dr. Decker, maybe he knows better. I don't remember on requirements about uh, geological uh, works. Okay. I do not, I, I'm sorry, I do not remember the site license, which is a 
complicated document, so much in detail. Yeah. I do remember, I think that there is some requirement still open for soil liquefaction, which is another type of hazard related to earthquakes. Um, I'm not, this I do think I remember that there should be some investigations with, with respect to this type of hazard. Soil liquefaction is meaning then when you shake what saturated soil, uh, then it loses its strength and the, the buildings can sink into the soil and collapse. Okay. Well, one additional question. Uh, maybe in September, the Nuclear Regulatory Authority will give the permission to, for construction, which means that, as far as I have read the Hungarian media, digging of the fundament should not start earlier than the construction license is released. This means that there is a time frame uh, by which digging, trenching could take place on the place where the reactors of Paksh 2 should be built. Could that be something to clarify uh, open issues? In principle, yes, but we would have to ask Tamash because he made a statement on how deep the soil was disrupted below the ground surface due to digging other constructions and whatever in, in the Park 2 site proper. He knows this from his seismic analysis uh, because you can very, it's very difficult to make a 10 meters deep trench. This is extremely difficult and, 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 and <laughs> even yeah. dangerous. But the point is that when you, we will build up the fundaments for the new power plant. You will go much more deeper than 10 meters. So there certainly you will have possibility to have a look on the sediments, isn't it? Yes, if, if, if you are invited by the building company and, and left to do that. No, it could be an obligation from the regulator in the construction license, for example. Yes, it, it's not my, my area. So okay, no. okay. I will give the floor to other ones. And what happens if, if the evidence is gone in the light and, and the Someone says that it should be stopped. Well, yeah. The point is uh, to build a nuclear power plant on a site which is in doubt to be appropriate is not only a pure Hungarian issue, as such a hazard is a risk for a lot of persons in and outside of Hungary. So why it would be wise to make an international audience for such a trenching. Yes, I agree. Okay. That's it. Anything else? Yes. Hi. <clears throat> I'm Tomás Bodoki. I'm the son of Tomás Bodoki senior, and I'm the journalist who tried to try to investigate this issue. And, and when I confronted the original authors of this uh, geological study, who carried out this study for, for Paksh, they, they tried to convince me that, yes, that, that indeed there is a fault line and, and this is all true, but this fault line is not capable of displacing the surface. And they are very convinced that this fault line is not capable, this cannot move the surface. What is your opinion on, on, on this? Well, yeah. Yeah. I think uh, as I concluded, we see no safe exclusion of the hazard of fault capability by these data. We are even inclined to see the proof that such faults are existing near to the site by the evidence of the trench that has been made of 700 meters south of the existing MPP. But again, we are on a level now 
uh, we have read and I think understood all the geological data. And now we would, as, an, as the Austrian party, would be very interested to hear a Hungarian response. A discussion with the authors of, the, of these reports, because they, of course, know their data. And this would be extremely interesting and important for us to have a technical discussion on, on such a basis. What is the opinion of the authors of the geological site report? Not so much of the authors of the site safety report, because there are differences between these reports. Uh, we hope that we get an opportunity to discuss with our Hungarian colleagues, and we also hope to get an opportunity to discuss with the uh, nuclear regulatory authority in Hungary, how they assess this type of hazard and how they came to, conclusion, to the conclusion that this site is a safe site. But this requires discussion. I have a very strong geological opinion, but uh, going behind that requires further clarification with our Hungarian colleagues. Thank you. Are there more questions? Um, because I think that, the, of course, the, the idea of continuing uh, these obviously open questions with the international um, forum would be a very good idea. And as far as I'm informed, there will be some bilateral discussions between the Austrian and the Hungarian side. But um, are there other, could, could we think of other, um, um, for which would be relevant, like the IEA is, do they perhaps have, I know that many of us have some experiences with IEA emissions and they are not always the best when it comes to transparency or, or reporting, but would this make sense? I don't know, do you think, um, or don't they have, I don't even know whether they have seismic reviews, but I guess they do because they also put out guidelines and recommendations. Yes, I know that the uh, IEA does such reviews, but it does it on, upon the request of the country that invites. Yes, so it's not course. that somebody mm -hmm. from the outside can say, uh, please check this and that nuclear power plant. So it must be a Hungarian drive to, to, to say, to invite the mission, whatever frameworks there exist, mm -hmm. uh, to, to do such a second opinion or whatever, or assessment or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if there is no, um, no more inputs, no more requests, um, we started a little bit in preparation of this discussion, thinking about when um, this, yes, is, is, is insecurities or at least not proven seismic um, safety whether this would have an impact on, on the licensing. And already the construction license was mentioned by Franz Meister that it's coming up. The question is, um, for example, the site license from 2017, do we think that this could be reviewed? Is it possible to discuss this with the Hungarian Nuclear Authority the regulator to ask, ask for this? Or should we try um, on some other level? Perhaps there is also NSREC we could discuss, of course, with the other regulators, how to proceed in this case. Or does this sound undoable? Yeah, as far as I know, the, uh, the Austrian Ministry for the Environment, which is now has another name, uh, <laughs> already <laughs> uh, approached the Hungarian side with the request to to organize a technical workshop to mm -hmm. clarify all the questions. The report that I presented has a thick part in the back of all these pages, which probably not everybody would read, but there are a lot of questions formulated to the Hungarian nuclear regulators that we would like to clarify. Okay. And these include, I mean, you can read through these if you if you mm -hmm. have time and, and, and if you want to do that, but uh, they address also the way how, uh, how the conclusion that the site is suitable came into existence. 
Okay, thank you. I see Benedek. Hi, you also wanted to say something. Yeah, uh, just to uh, to react uh, to this question regarding the yeah. possible overview of uh, the site permit, and and we are analyzing uh, this opportunity. Unfortunately, legally, as mm -hmm. or or for NGOs or um, any legal entities in in Hungary, seemingly it's quite difficult uh, to ask for a, a revision of the uh, the site permit. Uh, because uh, partly it was uh, issued um, quite a long time ago and uh, we were not um, um, partners in the procedure or we were not part of the, the procedure. Um, there is um, a few opportunities and we are still analyzing them. One is that uh, basically in a case when a, a, a such kind of site permit is issued against the, the law, then uh, the um, uh, prosecution office could initiate a legal overview or, or re a revision of the, uh, the permission. Unfortunately, as we know, uh, the public prosecutor in chief is a Fidesz guy um, and uh, we cannot expect too much uh, that uh, the public prosecutor will initiate this legal overview of the, uh, the site permit. Still, we may and, and we are still um, we are considering what is the best uh, way to go, but we may initiate or we may um, submit um, a claim to the public prosecutor's office to uh, to initiate or to start a, a legal revision, partly because we believe that uh, the permit was issued against the Hungarian law, and with this Austrian study, uh, some basic um, and relevant new information uh, was unveiled. And this could also be a, a basis for a, a legal revision that, that um, basic and substantial new information is unwilled or, or come to the, uh, to the public. Uh, but uh, we will see how, how this might work uh, with the public prosecutor's office. The other option is that the environmental permit, uh, or not the environmental permit, but uh, uh, the construction permit is still not issued. As, as Franz already mentioned, we expect uh, uh, the construction permit to be issued in uh, perhaps in September this year. Um, and uh, we may try to intervene in this procedure. Again, the problem that none of us is, uh, is part of this uh, procedure. So we are not um, accepted partners in the, in, in the, in the procedure. Um, so um, still it's not completely clear how this could be uh, carried out, but uh, that's another option that, uh, uh, unfortunately the, the construction permit doesn't deal directly with the seismic risks. So this should have been clarified in the site permit, but still we can try to intervene um, in, in the construction uh, uh, permit, but how to make it and who is the best, perhaps Energia Club as an NGO could be the one who could do that. As it, this is still uh, to, be, uh, to be clarified. Uh, not too much very uh, promising option, but it's not a completely lost uh, case from a legal perspective, I, I must say. Okay, thank you. I will quickly introduce uh, those Benedek, uh, you were a um, member of the European Parliament and are now I think you are with the Budapest House in, in Brussels. And Franz Meister, who talked before, works for the uh, Austrian Environment Agency and has been a nuclear expert for the past 30 years at least. And um, did I, um, I think, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, I forgot someone right now. So Mr. Uh, Gerner, I see you wanted to say something. Perhaps you could also introduce yourself. I have to admit, I don't know you. Okay, thank you. So I'm Peter Gerner, I'm from, from Atlas, so uh, also. But I'm also a geologist, and I was the very first guy who could read in Hungarian uh, the documents uh, when it came uh, to light in 2017. And I want to show an other option. Maybe it's a possibility to hook into the process of construction licenses. So not the site license, the site permit topic, but the next one, 
the construction licenses, which is due till end of September, so still open. And as I compared that time uh, the reports, there is, a, in my opinion, a very weak point on uh, uh, grant acceleration value. It was what Kurt and, and Franz Meister also mentioned. So this is an acceleration value telling the engineers how strong the building should be, how big acceleration the buildings uh, should uh, sustain if something happens. And this uh, grand acceleration value was estimated in this geological uh, uh, report by a very small team in Hungary, using lots of assumptions. This comes from, from the method because this is hard to estimate, but still very few people came to a conclusion saying grand acceleration can be uh, 0.3 or something like this. And my opinion is that this value and how this team came to the conclusion that this is the, uh, this is the uh, grand acceleration what can be expected at Fox, this should be reviewed. It should be, be reviewed by an other teams uh, running through doing once again the uh, estimations because this grand acceleration value, a very simple number, but very important for all the engineers. If they want to have a strong building, if they want to have a strong engines, turbines, whatsoever in the, in the power plant, then have to have uh, an exact value here. And this is uh, um, not reviewed. This is just a conclusion of one uh, small team, nothing but, uh, but necessary in the scientific world to have a peer review, to have a double check, to, to challenge their conclusion, to challenge their assumption has been done. This is just a simple statement. Grand acceleration could be an around box, this acceleration value and no discussion since then. The value is five year old, five year is out, published. There was no uh, scientific discussion on that one, no review. Uh, so I think this could be challenged very similar way, but, but could. Uh, and, and the colleagues were doing on Palau Seismic, a very sim similar way, other independent teams, uh, expert on seismology and engineering could challenge this and double check whether this value is, is uh, uh, good enough or what is the uncertainty in this value. Okay, that's of course another very interesting aspect. Um, we have Officially three more minutes, but I won't kick out anyone. Perhaps Gabi allows us a few minutes. But still to wrap up, I think there were suggestions um, on how to continue, very concrete ones. Um, I hope it's okay for most of you if I would suggest we try to, to draft a letter to whoever yet. I would think of course the European Commission, since they have the safety directive, which they should look after at some level. And although it doesn't say construction license in Hungary, I think they are um, responsible. Perhaps we come up with someone else. So, so to draft a statement where we would mention those points that, that we discussed here. I am always not able to uh, draft this on my own, but I think um, those suggestions put this in. If that's okay, if we would contact you in, in the next days, I think this, this could be an idea forward because September is approaching, obviously. And if there are more ideas, um, uh, we would, of course, help. Is there anything more uh, someone wanted to say before we really um, say goodbye for this time? I would, I would like to raise one question, which is more on atmosphere. Well, Atlas Do has done a very good job publishing a lot of good articles on the issue. So they are out of uh, scope, so to say, when I ask, what could be done to address this issue to a wider Hungarian public if this is, is be considered as necessary or should we focus on international level? Uh, I think it would be good to reach a wider audience in Hungary. Originally in 2017, when we filed a freedom of information lawsuit and in the result of this lawsuit uh, 
geologic uh, study was released and published, there was uh, uh, an upper or and there were new species in in mainstream media that time. But uh, but then the experts and even the geological experts who concluded who who uh, carried out these investigations, these measurements, they they told the public that there is nothing to see here. This fault is existing, but it's not capable of displacing the surface. And basically they labeled it a political hysteria to, to talk about this issue. So the whole issue settled in Hungary. And, and now I don't think the general public is aware if, if there is a problem or not. Oh, well, surely, may I add something? Well, what I have observed uh, that this Paksh issue now became public in media in Brazil, in Denmark, in Romania, in Croatia, yeah. Uh, and beside Atlazo, there are very few other ones. So uh, I would not give up the idea to attract the problem itself to a Hungarian public. Uh, it will depend on our Hungarian colleagues uh, that they could organize, it should organize such an event, uh, which could be attractive for Hungarian media as well. And I, I would say, well, I cannot agree at present, but uh, some guys involved in this Austrian paper could be invited or you could do it by yourself, however, uh, but this could be an opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, let's see whether, Kurt, do you want to go to Budapest? It's a kind of roadshow then. Yeah, I, I fully agree, but we need independent experts because if, op if Hungarian uh, journalists or Hungarian politicians talk about this, if Benedek Javor start to talk about this, it will be easily discredited. So it would be important to have uh, independent experts like Dr. Decker, who has no interest in the case. Yeah, you know, this is a funny thing. Well, last thing what I wanted to mention that uh, we got telephone calls from several countries, but nobody called us from Hungary. Uh, so there were some reports on the Austrian study, so to say, which is not an Austrian study, as Kurt stressed. What we did, we translated and tried to read the Hungarian arguments compared. So uh, it was not own research, it was uh, scientific reading as it should be. Yeah, But anyway, yeah. Uh, so um, far, no mass media from Hungary had contacted us or Kurt or someone else. But as, as you so are far. aware, we have wider problems with Hungarian media being yeah. under the influence of the governing party. And obviously, the governing party is uh, interested in Pox. So mainstream media will not really pick up on your case. Okay, I think we need to keep this in mind if we try to organize something there. Um, we should make sure that we find someone who is not us who invites, for example. Let's see how far we can mobilize some European uh, interest in this. But I also think it's a, of course, we should try. Um, Gabi, you tried to say something a while ago. No, I just mentioned that uh, Priska posted something in the chat and Josef Kubor. Yes. Um, Priska, you want to say something, or Josef, because otherwise we're soon heading towards the end? Um, my question was more a technical one um, when it comes to planning any in interventions in, in the licensing, licensing process or procedure until September, but I think this can also be clarified at a later stage. So. Yes, um, thank you. Um, we, as I, as I hinted before we will try to contact uh, you those who, who will be able to contribute or have suggestions so certainly of course you too um joseph are you uh, hello hello hey. everybody uh, uh greetings for the old friends and uh, very shortly i i wrote in chat that practically these things what we heard about are evidences 
in 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 all the uh, professionals, and I am very glad to to uh, hear this uh, new informations and uh, that uh, I could hear Hungarian professionals. But of course, I don't know that this college are active college or or from pension uh, could speak. It is it is not. Uh, it is a very uh, big question that active professionals who work in institutions, in academy, uh, academy for, uh, for sciences and that other thing, other active uh, institutions, uh, what what uh, what uh, uh, what say? What what the, the, does he they say? It is it would be very important. Politically, this thing is uh, very. Uh, long time ago uh, communicated. We do that in the Hungarian parliament, in, in, in the politics, for instance, uh, me in the, in the local government in Pécs. Pécs is 70 kilometers far from Paks, but we are in the, in the nuclear chain because the, for, of the former uranium mines and maybe we will get the depositing place for high level activity radiation radioactive waste so we are very interested in that so thank you once more for this very good uh, program and uh, i i ask for the very heavy communication for that once more thank you yeah so i think unless there is something urgent someone wants to say oh christiana yes Yes, so I just, uh, I wanted to respond to your question, Patricia. I think that this should be taken up at the European and actually international level. Mm -hmm. There's much more hope, especially since it's rather urgent uh, concern. I know that the European Parliament, there's been interest, I think, with some MEPs, but uh, as for myself, I'll be participating in an our house uh, convention compliance committee event in Geneva in July and maybe I could formulate our well with I would like it would be great if I could get some help but I could formulate a, a formal complaint about in clients that's just one idea yeah mm -hmm. thank you we could discuss this also with Priska who has a lot of experience with Aarhus how this could work perhaps transparency or information so we could do this hopefully at some point yeah, so then thank you all very much. I think it was a really, very interesting um, meeting. Let's hope we also get um, this whole issue moving somehow, um, since it seems rather urgent to have these clear words from um, the geologists um, is uh, certainly alarming. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, goodbye. We will try to send out some minutes, certainly. It was a lot of information, very dense, I think. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.